On behalf of our director, Susan Weber, and our Dean, Peter Miller, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us for today's lunchtime seminar. Now, although this event is distributed by Bard Graduate Center from the island of Manahata within the ancestral homelands of the Lene Lenape people, I want to observe protocol and express gratitude to native hosts by acknowledging that I speak to you from my home on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc peoples. My home lies beside the ancient trail connecting the valley, the, the valley of the Missituk uh, River and the Musketaquid River. Um, that's the Mystic and Concord River. Regardless of title deeds, this remains native land. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Fernando Dominguez Rubio. Fernando describes himself on his website as, I quote, just a kid from Torrejon de Ardoz, now working as an associate professor in the Department of Communication, University of California, San Diego, while gravitating around the outer rims of sociology, science and technology studies, anthropology, art, design, and architecture. Now, I had to look this up. Torrejon de Ardoz is just outside Madrid. Fernando is a beneficiary of European higher education. He took his bachelor's and master's degrees at Madrid's Complutense University before going to Cambridge for his PhD in sociology. Thereafter, he was a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Research on Sociocultural Change at Britain's Open University and at New York University, a move that to our great benefit brought him to our shores. He's been at UC San Diego since 2013. Fernando has published an edited volume with Patrick Baird, uh, The Politics of Knowledge, uh, and a number of articles, including most recently, I think, one co-authored with a friend and colleague well known to us at Bard Graduate Center, Glenn Wharton. However, it was his 2020 book, Still Life, Ecologies of the Modern Imagination at the Art Museum, that brought him wide attention. This is quite simply the best sociological study of art museums that I've read in a very long time. It's so good because although Fernando has never worked in an art museum, he refuses to confine his analysis to what preoccupies nearly every outside commentator, arguably the least important aspect of museums. Uh, I'm exaggerating a bit. That is public gallery display and exhibition. For Fernando, the HVAC system is no less important and he has a connoisseur's penchant for boiler rooms. It's such a relief. Fernando's work on museums has raised a whole bunch of philosophical issues that as a philosopher of museums, I long to discuss, but I'll hold my tongue as I hand over to Fernando Dominguez Rubio to address us on the unnatural ecologies of modern art. Fernando. Well, thank you very much, Ivan, for the generous uh, introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to invite uh, to, to talk about uh, the book in this audience. So um, so the talk today is um, the natural ecologies of modern art. So it is the talk is going to be based on this book uh, and uh, the commercial announcement is that uh, it is now 20% discount on the UC Press website if you use that uh, code there UC, uh, UCP art. Okay so um, the talk, uh, the book uh, began for me uh, with this question, uh, which is a question that I borrow from one of my personal heroines, uh, Mirly Kellis. Uh, and the question that she posed uh, was after the revolution, who is going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? For me, this question uh, translated into a, a different question. Um, which is this one, which is how is it, how can we explore the worlds that have to be built to keep alive the forms of imagination that we inhabit? Uh, how do we make them endure and how we render them uh, powerful? Uh, and I uh, decided to um, explore this question uh, by focusing on one of the most um, eccentric and exotic forms of the modern imagination, which is that of art. Now, uh, you may find 
which I think that is condensed in this little artifact, which is a, a, a normal and banal uh, museum label. Now you may find this uh, uh, um, label straightforward, banal, and commonsensical. But what I want to argue is that the grammar of relations and categories that are embedded in this active artifact are actually extraordinarily weird, historically speaking, and strange. And um, to defend my case, and uh, the, the first thing that I need to do is to render these strange. Uh, and to do that, to defamiliarize ourselves and understand the weirdness of that wall label, uh, one of the things that I do in the book is to uh, say that we have to equip ourselves with an ecological method or an, ecolo uh, an ecological method as a way of asking questions. Now, one of the things that I want to say uh, is that uh, the first thing that we see once we uh, equip ourselves with, the, with these ecological lenses uh, to think about the museum is that uh, uh, all art is land art. Now, this is a kind of a provocative statement on purpose so that we can discuss it later if you want. Uh, but what I mean by this is that, um, you know, traditionally, uh, land, art, uh, land art has been understood as a specific artistic movement. These are artists working with the elements of the natural env environment, normally outside the gallery museum space in the wild. Now, what I want to say is that this definition of land art is, uh, is uh, mis misleading or incomplete, because I think that the boundary upon which it is premised uh, is false. Uh, because it is, it, it is based on the understanding that the artworks that are inside the museum are actually different from these kind of artworks like, you know, Spiral Dirty by Robert Smithson. And what I want to say is that actually the, the artworks that are inside the museum are exactly the same as this. Uh, because the museum uh, and everything that it contains is just another part of the natural environment. So the discontinuity between natural objects and cultural objects or inside and outside is an, is an artificial one. Now, what you have in the, uh, on the screen here is two images. One of them belongs to a geological cross-section and the other one is a painting cross-section. Now, for those of you who are conservatives or, have, or have, are familiar with these images, you probably know which one is which. Uh, but what I want to say is that, you know, that both images, uh, the only difference that in both images is uh, one of the scale. There is no other difference. Both are chunks of the material environment subjected to exactly the same chemical and physical laws. Now, you may say that, okay, I take your point uh, for things like paintings, but what about uh, uh, artworks like this, uh, which uh, are not uh, uh, based on materials, right? Like a performance like this, even Rainer's uh, performance. Now, my question would be is that that's this idea that all land is land art, uh, all, 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 all art is land art doesn't apply to this. Because this performance that was uh, done a few years uh, before the Spiral Duty, if you can see it now, is because uh, it was filmed. And uh, in film is this, it's just a combination of cellulose, gelatin, silver, silver halide crystals, which uh, exist pretty much like the, a painting does or a geological path does. And um, and actually, we are we were seeing that not because not simply because it was just um, filmed in in a film, but because it was transferred to the digital environment. And now, if you have the temptation of thinking of the digital environment as being something other than materials, you need to think it twice. Uh, this is a uh, this is a server in which many of these artworks are now stored, uh, which is nothing else than an amalgamation of metal, copper, and plastic. So. The point that I'm trying to make is that art objects, even those that are not intended to be uh, land art, must become uh, land art. They have to be inscribed in the order of, order of things to survive. Now, once we take this into account, there is a second thing that we learn by looking at uh, uh, art ecologically. And the second thing that we learn is that an art object is uh, a moment in the life of a thing. Now, uh, this may sound counterintuitive because art objects, especially those in the museum, um, are often offered to us as a sublimated spectacle of stillness. 
Now, what I want to argue is that that spectacle is just a carefully curated mirage of a stillness uh, that is made possible by a particular temporal scale. Now, why do I say that is a mirage? Because if we change the scale, uh, the temporal scale through which we look at these things, what we see is that rather than an object, what we have is a moment in the life of something that, in this case, metal, that is relentlessly taking place. Now, uh, to say that objects are moments in the life of things may sound confusing since we normally think of objects and things as being the same thing, uh, as being the same. So what I want to suggest is that actually we have to separate things and objects. Um, and the reason for that is because I want to argue that things uh, are uh, meaningless, aimless, relentless material processes that unfold over time, whereas objects are the particular positions that things are subsumed to in order to participate in different regimes of meaning and value. So what that means is that the identity of something as an object is not something that is given, that inheres in its materiality, but it's something that has to be achieved. It has to be continually maintained over time. And this is actually, it turns out to be very difficult. Keeping things as subject is very difficult uh, because uh, uh, the order of things is always colonizing and devouring the order of objects. It's always taking over the order of objects. And as it, that happens, it creates a discrepancy between objects and things, between what we want objects to be and what they, what they actually are. And sometimes actually that discrepancy uh, grows so much, is so wide, that then objects begin to lose their identity and they locate themselves at thresholds in which we have difficulty in finding a name for them. Like for example, this one, in which we don't know if it's a ruin, if it's junk, if it's heritage, if it's a dead object, is what it is. Now, um, if we go back to the museum uh, with this in mind, what we realize then is that the spectacle, despite the spectacle of the stillness that it offers, uh, a museum is never a collection of objects, but it's a collection of, of uh, slowly unfolding disasters. Now, these are disasters that cannot be stopped because the second law of thermodynamics, uh, as we know from the second law of thermodynamics, you know, entropy is the law of life. So uh, the problem then is that, you know, objects are always deserting us. Uh, and the only way of uh, preventing this desertion would be to steal life itself. Now, that is not possible. So given that is not possible, then what, do, what can we do? Well, what we have done uh, in the modern times is that uh, creating these fabulous uh, machines that are machines for still in life. And that is what a museum is. Uh, a museum does not, of course, stop life uh, uh, or stop the, the relentlessness of things, but at least it can slow them down. Now, here I want to be very clear that when I'm talking about the museum as a machine, I am not talking about it in any metaphorical sense. A museum is literally a machine, and this is the, uh, one of the steam rooms at MoMA. Uh, uh, and so the question is, is, is you know, is, okay, they're a machine, but what kind of machine is a museum. Now, what I want to argue is that a museum is a mimeographic machine. Now, uh, what I, uh, this term mimeographic, what it means is uh, it means doing the same. So what I want to suggest is that a museum is a museum uh, designed to build sameness into the world by trying to prevent the difference that things create in their relentlessness. And to say that in a more clear sense, what a museum tries to do basically is to prevent uh, or to slow down as much as possible what you see here happening on the left to preserve what you see on the, on the right. So the idea then is that a museum is a machine that tries to negate things, to deny things as much as possible to create objects that can remain identical to themselves. Now, one question that we can ask here is that why do we need this? I mean, why do we need to negate things to preserve objects identical to themselves? Now, the reason for that is that the museum, the modern museum, is operating under the very idiosyncratic aesthetic regime that we have come to call modern art. And modern art is based on a very particular definition of what counts as an object. 
In the modern aesthetic regime, uh, an art object must be legible as the original, singular, and authentic production of the artist's intention and creative agency. An easier way to say that is that an object, an object has to be identical to the subject that it created it. So that is what the, the, what the museum is trying to do, is to keep objects as much as possible identical to the artist that created them, to prevent that they desert the artist. Now, this is, a, when you come to think about it, it's a very unnatural relationship, because as we have seen, objects are always deserting us. So this uh, relationship of uh, uh, an object that is identical to its subject does not exist in the wild. Uh, it can only exist under very specific artificial conditions. And that is what the museum does. It tries to create these artificial conditions by generating an unnatural ecology that preserves the conditions under which an object can be stilled or slowed down to the point that it remains identical to the subject that it created it. Now, this is kind of an anecdote, but I was thinking about different ways of, uh, when I was writing the book and thinking about the museum, how to describe the museum, one of the first thoughts that I had is that you know, a museum is like a greenhouse that creates the condition in which you can grow this peculiar variety of objects that we call art objects, but then actually settled for another, uh, uh, metaphor, which I think that is actually much more literal, literal uh, that is to think of the museum as an intensive aesthetic care unit, uh, as, uh, as an ICU for art objects. And when you think, to, uh, when, when you think about it, actually, it is, and I'll show you in a second, it's is, is not a far-fetched metaphor. Um, these aesthetic, intensive aesthetic care units uh, have to meet two functions. The first one is to create the life support systems that builds sameness into objects to make sure that they remain more or less stable. And what you have here, I mean, I'm just playing, being playful with the, with the metaphor, you know, in, this very, in the same way that we have uh, ICUs equipped with all these uh, uh, technologies to make sure that a body is stable, we have uh, a bunch of technologies in the museum, like a, a thermohygograph here on the, on the right and the HVAC system that goes with it. Uh, to make sure that we guarantee this, the conditions, the uh, uh, temperature and the humidity conditions that uh, are, um, make possible for an art, for an artwork to remain more or less stable, um, we have you know people caring for them in more or less the same way, uh, just uh, keeping an eye on them. Nobody touches them, and of course we have. Uh, different practices and here you have a conservator on the right and get temperature light measurements uh, uh, to make sure that. Um, that the, that the artworks are not damaged. Uh, now, so one of the things that they have to do then is, I mean, this, uh, this intensive care units is to create the environment in which the artwork more or less re remains the same. So it's to build artificial sameness into the world. The other thing that they have to do is that uh, they also have to make sure that they are perceived as the same. I'm not going to get too much into this, but in the book I go at length into what I call the anesthetic void, which uh, what I claim is that uh, one of the things that the museums has to create is to create an unnatural ecology to stabilize perception by creating what I call an anesthetic void, void, which is a system that guarantees a stable, pure, and uncontaminated encounters with the artwork, making sure that what you see is not distorted and is an adequate representation of the author's intention. And that implies many things, like, for example, building silence into the, uh, um, into the uh, museum, which is done in different ways here. On the, on the one on the floor is actually part of that uh, technology. This is not MoMA, by the way. Also controlling others, smell. And of course, the most important one is controlling light and color. Uh, so you have to create this, uh, uh, this machine is not only about creating, uh, stability, uh, creating stability for objects, but also creating the stability of the perception through which we uh, relate to objects. If we take this into account, and again, I'm just trying to be provocative uh, for, the sake of the, for the sake of the conservation, you can actually even say that museums never display objects. What they do is to produce objects, or you want to say is that they produce objects for display. They're constantly turning things into objects in a particular way. Now, uh, when we talk about museums, we, 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 we must not forget that what we have seen so far, which has to do with the exhibition gallery, is a tiny fraction of the mimeographic labor that goes into the museum. 
the largest and arguably the most important part of this labor takes place uh, outside the gallery. And the reason for that is in, in spaces like this, which is the storage, which is where most art actually lives. Uh, this is in big museums is where 90% of the collection actually lives. Now, interestingly, uh, interestingly uh, the storage uh, 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 are hardly ever part of the conversations about, uh, the, uh, about art. And I find this um, uh, weird because it's where most art, uh, art, art normally is. And I think that you know, part of the reason why we don't talk too much about uh, uh, storage is because they're seen as places where we just put stuff and that's, that's it. So there's actually not much to say about, about it. But what I want to say is that actually, uh, these are the most formidable mimeographic machines ever created to turn things into objects. Uh, to deny things so that they can be kept as objects. And how this denial is done in these spaces is crucial to define how art objects move over space and time. Uh, about about uh, time, for example, it is thanks to these machines that we can build duration into uh, uh, art. Uh, and they do so by transforming the most fragile things like pieces of uh, paper into more or less a stable object that can last for a couple of centuries. And, and in, in such a way that they can remain attached to the authors and that we can make claims that there is still the authentic representation of the author's intention. So it is thanks to this that we can sustain uh, the predicates that are inscribed in a label like this. Uh, without these machines, it would be very difficult to sustain labels like this. In terms of, um, when I say that they can, they, they, they may possible to, uh, uh, they define how our move over time and space. So in terms of the space, these mimeographic machines um, build the forms of ecstasies uh, uh, that make uh, possible, the, the generate the movement through which objects move into space. And this is very particularly important today because contemporary art and the exhibitionary system that fits it and the market that uh, profits from it is currently predicated upon movement, upon what I call in the book, a, a regime of generalized movement. Art today moves, it's moving all the time. What you have here is an outdated a statistic from 2016 uh, from uh, the AAMD. Uh, and this is uh, the number of artworks that were borrowed and loaned just in US, Canada, and Mexico. So almost, uh, you know, 100,000, more than 100,000 artworks. They're constantly moving. And if they move, uh, uh, it is because all these things are taking, to, uh, are taking place. Now, what is important to understand here is that these are not simply background operations. Uh, what I want to argue in the book uh, and here, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, is that the invisible geographies of storage is what sustains, enables, and defines the visible geographies of art. Now, reaching this point, you may think that, that everything that I've talked about uh, makes sense, if it does, uh, for traditional uh, artworks like sculpture or paintings, but what happens with uh, artworks like this, like Yvonne Rayner's uh, performances or this Joko Ono piece that is an apple that is about to uh, rot, right? Uh, in, in, in these cases, you may think that any kind of mimeographic label trying to prevent things from, trying to deny things is just absurd. I mean, no one is going to try to uh, preserve that apple, right? So uh, what we have to understand here is that mimeographic labor in the museum does not only take place by denying things, but it also takes place through what I call different styles of repetition. So one of the repetitions uh, that uh, happens in the museum is by provoking presence in absence. This is a, a, a turn of phrase that, um, that I borrowed from Amelia Jones, um, which defines uh, these kinds of uh, uh, archival uh, gestures as uh, bringing the artwork in absence. Uh, so what we, you can think about this is uh, that the museum creates double ganglers that bring into presence the artwork as a mental image. And that is another way in which the artwork is repeated as something that looks more or less the same. Of course, there are artworks in which that becomes much more difficult as in, you know, these artworks that, uh, that require some kind of embodied experience uh, and in which, you know, the, the, the document will not fulfill the, uh, that, the, their presence, right? 
So in that case, one of the things, another style of repetition that museums are increasingly engaged in is by provoking presence in the flesh. And this is a style of repetition that takes place through reenactments. And what you have here is a piece that I uh, talk at length in the book, which is Simone Fortis' Haddle, uh, which you can think of this, um, artworks as the most elusive of objects. They only exist momentarily through a barely traceable configuration unfolding in space through bodies, right? So producing a repetition in this case actually requires a massive uh, amount of mimeographic labor of a different kind. In this case, for example, it took uh, more than two years to be able to describe the object and make a, a, a repetition. And that included interviews with the artist, interviews, the, in, uh, in, it required uh, uh, documentation, it required a recording, uh, trying to identify and specify which elements were deemed essential and which were invariable, which had to be preserved, which could let uh, go of. And then uh, in addition to that, the, the museum even created uh, an, a new ecology of practice of training people to do, to do these artworks. And when, with that in place, what you have is an artwork that can, the demographic labor here is that of repeating, uh, 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 making a form of repetition that can fulfill the promise that it is bringing a return of the same. Okay, so, the question here uh, is why does this all mimeographic label matters? Why should we paying attention to this anyway? So um, what I what I want to argue, well, well, one easy answer would be that you know it matters because it is through this mimeographic labor, understanding this mimeographic labor and the massive ecology that it brings or it requires, it's uh, how we understand what needs to be in place to hold the boundary between memory and oblivion and to help us undo or at least uh, defer to an extent the fragility of presence. So that's one uh, way of answering it. Now, in addition to that, uh, I want to argue that paying attention to this mimeographic labor and the ecologies that it implies or necessitates, it is it's also important to understand that modern art it is also an ecology of erasures. Uh, what I want to say with, for this is that in order, sustaining these presences requires a lot of uh, an ongoing work of erasing and deleting something else. And it is important to understand what we are erasing and deleting in order to make this particular form of presence possible. So I'm gonna just go over a, a few of them and then I'll, I'll conclude. So one of the things that this ecology, I think, this modern ecology of art erases is actually its own erasures. And what I mean by this is the following, is that very often when we think about care and, and how we are caring for these subjects so that they are kept alive, we think of care as the opposite of neglect, as, as its antithesis, or even as its remedy. So if, you know, the remedy of neglect is care. And what I want to argue is that actually that is never the case in the museum. Care is not the other of neglect. Um, any form of keeping entails a form of loss that is as its necessary and avoidable shadow. And what I mean by this is that, you know, in this case, for example, one of the things that I, one of the artworks that I focus on the book is the one on the left is a Pollock that, uh, was, uh, that, in, that, that was taken care of. And there was a huge uh, conservation effort to clean and uh, that artwork. But every time that there is a conservation, uh, uh, that there is a project like that, there is a choice about which one is going to be selected for care and which one is not going to be selected for care. And, uh, uh, and that implies uh, that caring for something is always, uh, always means leaving something else out. Uh, and it, it, it implies that because caring for these things implies a lot of labor. In the case of, for example, the Pollock, it took, it took almost a full year just to clean that piece. In that year, and the, the, the resources that are in, uh, invested in that year, in that year could not be then in, uh, put into something like, for example, this Janet Sobel, right? Um, now, you may, I think that this becomes even more present and more important to think about this idea that care always brings its own neglect. Uh, when we think not about artworks like this, like because to an extent, the Janice of take care of itself uh, uh, for a while. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artwork that is gonna exist uh, uh, for a while. But when we think about artworks that 
like this one, which all, whose presence all depends on being taken care of. This, this, uh, this kind of artworks, these like performances, can only be kept to the extent that they are cared for. If they are not, they just uh, vanish into oblivion. And it is also important to know that you know, increasingly contemporary art is filled with these kind of artworks that are actually much more intensive in, in, the terms, in, in terms of the labor that they require to be kept alive. Uh, in the case of it's important, as I said before, it was not just about a cleaning operation. You have to uh, create a whole different ecology to sustain them and to make sure that they don't they, they, they don't vanish into oblivion, which entails in, in training people, creating uh, a documentation, etc. This is a, a multi-year effort that has to be constantly kept alive. So with these hours, actually, the, the, the question about or the dilemma of care uh, becomes even more present because the voting for each Simon Forte that is uh, being held, many others are just not being preserved. So in a museum, what I want to say is that care always produces neglect. In a museum, forgetting is not the other of keeping. Loss is always created in the name of care. And that reveals what memories are being narrated today, where they are narrated, and more importantly, by whom they are uh, narrated. Another important thing that uh, this, um, this focusing on labor, that it, and the labor that is required to sustain this ecology, um, uh, reveals is how much of this labor, how much these ecologists erase the labor through which they exist. And to understand this, I think that it's good to think about it as a gestalt image in which if you want to see the background, you cannot see the foreground. You never can see both at the same time. So you have to choose, uh, seeing the foreground means not seeing the background. And I think that that is uh, the exhibition as it is constituted today, uh, is pretty much like a gestalt image in which what you see in the foreground is uh, a particular form of labor that is the labor of the artist, the object of the, of the artist and the creators and on the background invisible uh, and has to remain invisible is all the other forms of labor that go into the mimographic, uh, into the this mimographic labor from uh, registers, conservators, uh, uh, and preparators and the rest of it that have to be, be invisible, not to disrupt what is in the on the front. And I think what is at stake here is uh, in this kind of um, uh, game of foreground and underground, uh, foreground and background, is that uh, which forms of labor are rendered visible and valuable, in which are written into invisibility and thus denied any claim of authorship or rights or value. And I think that it is important to understand this because uh, uh, to understand how these ecologies willingly or unwillingly uh, uh, depend on a system of visibilities and invisibilities through which uh, they actually are perpetuating a system of social inequalities that structures them by relegating certain forms of labor to invisibility and therefore and making it difficult for them to claim any form of uh, value. Now, the question of uh, labor is linked to the question of the particular geographies that these ecologies imply. Because everything that we've seen so far, the labor infrastructures required to sustain these unnatural ecologies is actually beyond the reach of most uh, museums or small institutions. Now, this is important uh, because these ecologies that we, these unnatural ecologies that we've been discussing are not optional. They have become compulsory. These are normative ecologies. Uh, what you see here is a, 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 a portion of a loan agreement in which, you know, in order to be able to loan an object, the, uh, the, 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 the receiving institution has to guarantee all these uh, uh, um, uh, criteria uh, that, that very often are not possible to sustain outside wealthy museums or um, museums in moderate climates. So uh, this actually has two effects. One of them is that, you know, these normative ecologies or the normativity of these ecologies creates a geography of exclusions. There are big swaths of the planet that simply cannot uh, uh, be included in the system of circulation through which our contemporary art and modern art is being organized today, because they simply cannot receive the objects uh, that are circulating uh, there because they, don't, they cannot uh, uh, meet those requirements. 
The second part that I think that is actually more, is more subtle, but is more insidious, is how the promise of care creates an asymmetry of exchanges. And what I mean by this is that, you know, it is those museums that can offer the, this care, uh, that can create these ecologies, these expensive ecologies, are the ones that end up receiving uh, these objects because they can promise to care for them. And what happens with this is that you end up uh, creating an extractive system in which there's the leads to a huge accumulation of objects uh, from uh, those places that cannot care for them to those that can care for that. And that actually normally goes along the lines of an accumulation uh, of uh, uh, a circulation of uh, uh, an accumulation of objects in the north from the south. And this has a a very important consequence, which is that very often, many of these artworks from the South end up in the storage of the North, uh, and they have to face this kind of devil's bargain in which they are offered to be taken care of at the, at the cost of invisibility, because many of these artworks end up in museums in which they are not part of the, of the main narrative um, of those institutions. So they are taken care of, but they are never displayed in the end. And here I want to just make a very, very short note um, to think about you know, all the current uh, polemics about uh, the accession. I think that it is very closely linked to this uh, form of uh, material accumulation that has taken place over the last century in which big museums end up with massive unwieldy storages that they don't know what to do with. But that's something that we can discuss later. The other thing that happens with these ecologies is that they erase themselves. And this is actually something that I think that is uh, increasingly not the case, but is worth mentioning. And what I mean by this is that it's an ecology that denies that it is an ecology. It's sometimes in the museum and in art, it seems that the ecology is, are the others, not us, because the museum is just these kind of cultural artifacts that are uh, sustained in the museums as if that didn't have any kind of ecological imprint. And I think that one of the things that we have to remind uh, ourselves constantly is that what you see in the left is made possible what you see on the, on the right. The museum and the museum as a system, including the storage, is an, uh, an increasingly unsustainable, uh, uh, ecologically speaking, apparatus that uh, uh, that denies that, that is an ecological apparatus, if I, that makes that makes sense. And the final one that I want to say is that actually uh, that this ecology erases its own historicity. And I think that this is actually for me the most important one is that we have to constantly remember that the, the way the museum and modern art is organized is historically speaking, an eccentricity, uh, as something that is actually an exception. There are many other forms through which, uh, there are many other aesthetic regimes that have constructed memory and have constructed meaning and have constructed imagination that do not necessarily pass through this impossible denial of objects that the modern uh, uh, art is organized around. So one of the things that we, the thing that's important to uh, think is how could this be otherwise? And which is another way of asking, what if we undid these erasures that the ecology of art is uh, currently premised on? And if what if in, the, in that case, we could ask questions like, what if we accept things rather than trying to deny them in the pursuit of an impossible dream of timeless objects and a lossless part? What if the cost of those modern ecologies is simply too high? What if it is not necessary to have an original authentic object to build meaning, narratives, and imagination? And what if your originality, authenticity, and authorship uh, could be defined otherwise? And with that, I conclude and I thank you all for um, staying, bearing me, and I look forward to the, to the questions. Thank you so much, Fernando. That was so rich, such a lot to talk about. I'd like to invite everyone on the panel to reveal themselves. And we have a wonderful group of people here. I have so many questions that I want to ask, uh, but I feel that I, I'm going to ask us one, I can't, I can't stop myself. And that is, how does what you've been describing to me very persuasively apply to the commercial art world? Because the intersection of the modern contemporary art museum and other mu art museums with the commercial art world 
is extremely important. Years ago, uh, I went to a lecture by uh, Joseph Boyce and I knew the curator. So I thought I'd stick around, be I'll stick around later and help clean the blackboards. Uh, but a couple of guys from Anthony Doffe Gallery came straight in and whipped them away because these were precious relics of Boyce's lecture performance. Uh, now I know better, I would expect that, but I, I wonder how these, these worlds intersect. Well, that's a great question. So I have many anecdotes about that. So the one that is similar to yours, I remember talking to a curator uh, at the museum who had been a curator in a, in a commercial gallery. I think that I wrote that in the book actually. It, 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 and this person had been uh, uh, had seen one artwork in the, as, when she was uh, in the in the gallery, and she moved the artwork and put it on display. And then when she went to the museum, she could not touch it. <laughs> And she had to ask her permission, and then it was in the storage. And then she said, "It's the same artwork that I actually moved when I was in the in the museum." So in that way, that is that is different. But actually, I think that the difference is diminishing by the day. And one of the things that I try to emphasize in the in the in the book is how, for example, the system, the logistics uh, uh, that the museum has created has a lot to do with the system of exhibitions, which is which has to do with commercial the commercial system of uh, art fair and galleries and auctions. So one of the things that is happening, and this has to do, for example, with insurances, is that as, our, uh, as artworks have become more and more expensive, um, these uh, logics that the museum had have been incorporated into the commercial world because no one wants to send or ship a 100 million art piece and be a scratch in the process at the end. So, uh, so and in that sense, I mean, and, and then with the same thing with the exhibition uh, circuit is that, you know, these are artworks that are shipped around the world uh, for four or five exhibitions. So there's actually an increasingly, and, and, and you can also see that in galleries that look increasingly like museum galleries with the same HVAC systems, with the same, um, uh, lighting requirements and, and and everything. I I every time that I go to a gallery, I take pictures to all the equipment, and 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 now it's actually very difficult to see to know if I'm in an art gallery or in a in a museum. So I think that those those that those things are intersecting in the logic of the there's a logic of museification that is taking place and encroaching upon the uh, commercial art gallery, and that has to do with the market, with value, the value of art, and with the exhibition as the exhibition as the dominant form of uh, narrating art. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I'd like to ask our panelists if they would ask questions by, as Aaron has done, raising using the raise hand function. Uh, and those who are attending this uh, un unseen, if you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function and type your question in, and I will keep an eye on that. Aaron. Thanks so much. Fernando, it was it was incredibly rich, and at like every five minutes, uh, I have a question about. So, <laughs> I'm gonna I, um, I'm gonna try to stick to uh, sort of one question. It may take me a minute to get there. So, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this, um, I was you know sort of trying to unpack the kind of um, un unspoken citations uh, as you were speaking, and I was thinking you know that there was um, there was a kind of um, a legacy of sociology of art here, sociology and philosophy of art, obviously. So that have to do with art worlds, right? Arthur Danto, Howard Becker, Bourdieu. And then, and then there was this sort of more recent sort of new materialisms. And maybe Bruno Latour is the linchpin between those two discourses in some ways. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, a, a number of us have been sort of critical of around the new materialisms is the kind of singular focus on on the history of Western philosophy and sort of Western modes of being. And so I, I take that your project is sort of circumscribed and it is in fact about the peculiarity of those Western modes of being and I, I appreciate that and and I and I sensed in your move from protecting the object to protecting the individual artists who made that object um, something in that in that um, philosophical critique of the new materialism that that's really about a kind of critique of the authority of the western subject the inviolable singular agency of the western subject beyond art beyond art worlds beyond artists so this is getting me to my question when you were talking in particular about storage 
and um, the, the places of care and maintenance of objects behind the scenes, which would include storage shelves and also conservation labs. I, I was thinking in a comparative kind of a case of um, so-called ethnographic museums that in many cases over the last 20 or 30 years, the, the, plate, the spaces and protocols of care behind the scenes have been more exciting in terms of honoring the active life of objects than have exhibitions in many cases. And here's where I really get to my question, that do you think that thinking comparatively, not only outside of Western tradition in terms of the way art works or what sort of temporal imaginations and are, but thinking across the, out of the art museum to other kinds of museums where the, the infrastructures, but also the protocols of storage and care may provide some of the space for intervening in the very peculiar world that you sketched out for us so compellingly. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yes. So I think that, so I'm going to try to answer in two different ways, but I think there's the same way. So the one is that my overall project is to render uh, modernity is strange. And so try to undo its claim that this is it. Uh, and what I want to say is that no, this is not it. This is a very particular way of uh, creating meaning and imagination uh, that actually is quite weird. And in and one of the things that I try to, uh, towards the end of the book is that it's not only weird, is that you can even think of uh, modern art as an interruption to other ways, uh, to what has been the way in which we have different cultures have created meaning and imagination, none of which, or it's very difficult to find this, uh, this, this compulsion to deny things as the core of producing uh, meaning and, and, and imagination and memory, right? So one of the things that I try to do and is to open the question of, uh, uh, to render or to re-enchant modernity, right? Uh, so that's, that's one of the projects. Now, as I was writing the book is that, you know, yes, I can do that. And at the same time, the museum has a value and I cannot deny that. And I don't know, and I don't understand, and I couldn't understand what, what it was. So one of the things that I constantly was pushed against is, um, is, is this idea that, you know, there's the outside of the museum in which there are other uh, practices of doing this, uh, collective archives, decolonial archives, uh, artist collectives uh, that have been constantly trying to undo the museum, to render the museum strange from their own perspective and try to do things otherwise. And one of the things that I found with that, and, and it's always this, I mean, that's what I want to do, but I don't want to romanticize them as well. Because one of the problems that these uh, initiatives have is that, you know, care is extremely expensive and you need institutional uh, continuity and you need uh, all these resources. And one of the things that happens in the end is that many of these uh, archives, these other ways of doing stuff end up being in these uh, uh, big museums. Uh, which has the, which have the resources uh, to care for them. And that's why I want to emphasize that tragedy or paradox of care, which is, uh, which is in, you know, thanks to being in a museum, they are preserved, but probably there's a lot that is lost as well as a result of that. And I think that that is actually not, I think that, you know, there's this tendency, this dual tendency of romanticizing what is outside, demonizing the museum or vice versa. And I think that that doesn't get the paradox that, uh, that and, and, and the tension and the moral dilemma that is embedded when you, in, 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 when, when you actually think about how much care cost and, and how much, how difficult it is to preserve something in any way. I don't know if I run, I've, I've answered that. It's kind of an unanswer because because I don't because I think that for me is what is interesting to pose is the dilemma uh, more than giving an answer to that. Sure. Thanks. I'm going to uh, ask Sarah Scaturo for to to put a question. Hi, thank you. Um, in many ways, I think my question kind of follows up on your answer um, that you just gave. Um, it seems that you set up uh, situations that could be construed as zero sum, um, such as care produces neglect, 
If you see the background, you can't see the foreground and vice versa. And, you know, as I'm a conservator and I feel that so much of what we do has nuance. And, you know, there are so many gray areas that it's not just zero sum. And so I just wanted to see, you know, am I accurate in that reading um, or do you see it differently? Uh, it was clancy presentation. Uh, 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 so it's my fault. No, it's, 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 not, it's not zero sum at all. That is, that is, that is what I, I try to, what I try to say is that, you know, every form of, so what I'm trying to undo is that to think of this as a zero sum game. So, so if, if you care for it, then you are doing the opposite of neglect. Uh, if you don't care for it, then you're, the, then you're doing the opposite of care. And what I want to argue is precisely that, you know, that is never a zero sum game is that every form of, of, of care, no matter how extensive, no matter how well-intentioned, brings with it some form of loss. Uh, and, and what the conservator has to do is actually to dwell on that question. And what is the uncomfortable position of the conservator is that we can't just pose the questions, but you, uh, the conservators have to answer it. And every answer that they give uh, is never a zero sum game answer. And I, I mean, that's what, for example, one of the things that I like about conservation is that conservators are really aware of this. And that's, for example, why many of the things that you do can be undone because you're never sure about the answer. You're never sure about the gamble that you took. Uh, so that's one of the ways in which I normally think about objects uh, of conservation is as a tentative objects. This is, is a tentative answer that has been given and that uh, is given to be assessed and could be reassessed and undone uh, later on. So it's the, it's the only one that I do think that is a zero sum game is the foreground uh, and, and uh, background. I think that you know the whole museum is a structure around a system that systematically renders invisible a form of labor. And this has to, do, and, 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 and when I say this, people say, well, you know, one of the tendencies, one of the trends that is happening in museums today is that conservators have been highlighted. I mean, they are put on this, they, actually they're spectacularized, you know, with windows seeing what they do and that kind of thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they, they still have to remain invisible in the, in the artwork itself. So you can see them, but you cannot see them in the artwork. Uh, and that labor only exists to the extent that you cannot see them. Uh, and they cannot make any claim to the artwork. And that's actually, and, that, and this goes to something that I tried to do in the book, and I don't know if I succeeded, is that, you know, not every claim has to be an authorship claim. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is, that is, there are other forms of making and creating that do not have to do with authorship. And I think that the modernity has kind of cheated us into thinking that it is creation or nothing. And that is actually one thing that I have to do is I know there are many other forms of creating, of making a difference. And conservation, conservation is one of them uh, that do not necessarily go through authorship, but you cannot deny the labor and the difference that conservation makes. What you see, the Pollock that you see now, it is undeniably the one that results from different forms of labor. One of them is the, or, the, art, the artist, another of them is the conservators. If you subtract the labor of the conservation, of the conservators, you have a different artwork. And that is, that is undeniable. So, but we don't have a language uh, to uh, talk about those forms, recognizing those forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, labor and making claims that do not necessarily uh, go uh, up on, uh, that do not necessarily rely on authorship. So again, that is not a zero sum game. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you, that was helpful, thank you. We, we are running out of time, but I'd like to try to take two more questions. So um, I'm going to ask Jay Levinson and Peter Miller if they would please both ask questions and try to be as brief as possible. And then Fernando to answer as briefly as possible too. Jay. Okay, uh, I'll be brief. Mine's uh, questions on the relationship between museums of historical art and modern art. I mean, I'm glad you picked MoMA because I work there, but I think they're really on a, a continuum. I think the procedures that we use, I mean, Kate Lewis could say better than I, are based on procedures that were developed in traditional museums. 
but there's a particular problem and in, in our intellectual problems of having, uh, you know, uh, wor ephemeral works are quite fascinating. You, you mentioned that, but traditional museums have this problem of having works in wildly different states of preservation, and they rarely feel free enough to comment on that. And it's particularly difficult in uh, loan exhibitions where you have works from different lenders who don't want the poor quality of, of the preservation of their works you know, identified, you know, what do you do there? Because uh, people are looking at things that in fact are utterly different in terms of the preservation and no one's giving them advice. I hope, Fernando, you can keep that question in mind while I ask Peter if you will ask his. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Fernando. Uh, just very simply, you talked about um, uh, authorship just now, and I think that's the kind of stalking horse for talking about intention. And that leads you to think about the difference between art objects and objects that are collected for reasons aside from the intentions of their makers. So how much of your argument is, is pertinent only to art museums and how much could be extended to other types of museums? So the institutional angle. That one paradoxically is the easier one. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things that I do in the book is, is to talk about regimes of optic good. And, and what I mean by that, that is that every museum uh, has to produce a specific kind of object. In the case of uh, modern art museums, uh, that object is an intentional object. In the case of ethnographic museums, they work with a different regime of object in, in which intentionality is uh, very often not in the picture. Uh, but, th but then once you have, a diff uh, they still have to produce an object and it's an object that has to be linked to a culture, to a context. So they have to preserve a different relationship, uh, but the grammar and the line that is the same. What is a change is the kind of object that has to be produced as a result. I don't know if that makes uh, sense. So I think that is easily, so while, while I'm talking about one very specific regime of object, I could easily write about how this applies to the ethnographic museum by changing the kind of uh, object that has to be achieved there and the kind of uh, compromises and practices that have to be uh, uh, um, around that. Uh, Jay's question, uh, if I understand it correctly, is, uh, let me rephrase it just to say, to make sure that I, that I understood it, is what happens when lenders uh, are, can, don't want to show damaged things uh, uh, in the museum. Is, is that uh, more or less the, the... No, when lenders are sending works to an exhibition that are not in a good state of conservation and don't want to call attention to that, what do you tell the audience? Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, that, that is, you know, and go, going back to Aaron's uh, question is, uh, to our, the one comment that, made, that, that Aaron made about Bun Latour is that we have never been modern, which is that we are cheating ourselves constantly. Uh, and, you know, every artwork in the museum uh, has sustained some kind of damage. We try to pretend that that is not the case. Uh, and there is this fetishism for the new uh, that uh, denies that. And I think that one of the things that museums could do and that's what I'm saying is that what if we undo these erasures? What if we actually put these as part of what the artwork is? And I put some of these uh, Japanese practices in which the crack is not uh, hidden. The crack is embraced as part of what the object is. And, uh, you know, uh, encyclopedic museums are basically collections of maimed objects. Mm -hmm. uh, of replicas or uh, things that have that fragments. And, and, and a lot of uh, uh, historical memory takes place through that. So why do we want to pretend otherwise? Our, and that's one thing is that why do we want to pretend that uh, our history is a lossless history? Uh, when it's a history of fragments and losses through which we try to build an, uh, a narrative. And I think that you know, the museum could take steps to embrace that as part of what knowledge ma making, memory making, meaning making is precisely about. Of course, and I understand the reticence of the lenders because the market also plays something here. So that is, that is where those two logics, uh, uh, um, the idea of a damaged damage goods is not something that goes well into the market. So th that is where there's a tension between those two things.
Thanks so much. Well, your book is anything but damaged goods. It's, um, it's a splendid book. And I hope that uh, everyone registered that the discount code is UCPART. Um, so I hope everyone will who is interested in this, and I hope that's most people on this call, will take advantage of that opportunity. I'm sorry to have to, to uh, not call on a number of people who have uh, posted questions, but students have classes, faculty have classes, people have meetings, and we've had an extremely rich hour with Fernando Dominguez Rubio. I'd like to thank him uh, most heartily for sharing the ideas that he has written about in the book and beyond in this talk today. Thank you so much.